Sometimes we kind of overlook the basics as we uh, do the story of more advanced stuff. And then um, ended with uh, multi photon microscopy. Uh, someone pointed out to me that I did not have the microphone on the first time. So sorry about that. Uh, I hope more of you hear me now. Um, all right. So um, suffice to say, it's the lecture outline. You see it? So the, I'll try to follow this. Um, the books that wind up being useful. So the thing about microscopy, it's got a million books. You kind of have to cut and paste depending on the application uh, or the particular type of microscopy that you're working uh, with. Um, believe it or not, this book on the cell by Alberts is a very, very famous book. has a pretty nice chapter on microscopy that I encourage people to look at. Um, it's got some nice stuff about some other things in there as well. So you just want to pay uh, whatever amount of 100 bucks just for the chapter, but it's worth looking at. And then Pauli's book is considered the book on uh, microscopy, even though it has confocal in the title. Confocal is just a part of it. He talks about stead, four pi, multi-photon, tissue damage, everything you want to know, but maybe we're a little afraid to ask, is all in this book. Okay, uh, it's a compilation of works by a lot of famous people in the field. Um, if, for those of you who may not know this, um, I think when I started, this was just coming around uh, when I was a postdoc. Um, Olympus, Nikon, um, uh, and something else just called and generically, it's based at FSU, Molecular Expressions. They have some very nice Java-enabled tutorials on microscopy and the peripheral areas surround the microscopy. So if you want to learn a little bit more about detectors or laser sources or what have you, all of that is in these websites. They're interactive, they're very nice. It's not the type of thing where you just sit there and say, I want to learn about microscopy and go to the site, but you wind up, it's like an encyclopedia. So you wind up interacting with it based on how your learning progresses. All right, so microscopy, uh, as we know, has been a workhorse to cell biology. Um, since it goes back at least since 1838, some people argue even much older than that, depending on how you want to define a uh, microscope. Um, in 1838 is when you had the birth of the cell doctrine uh, that's basically recognizing that all tissues were composed of cells. This was recognized because one had a compound microscope that was developed that allowed the researchers to be able to see that. Typical mammalian cells uh, can be viewed using a uh, compound microscope, and this is before the invention of the laser or um, anything with second harmonic generation or uh, phase imaging. Nothing fancy, but you can, you can view cells uh, in the range of 10 to 20 microns. Keeping in mind that the smallest particle that you can see with the naked eye for, for uh, many people is on the order of about 100 microns. <laughs> Oh, okay, so this does not come out too well. <laughs> Ironic. Okay, so this is all about resolving power. Okay, so this is about the resolving power of the different uh, instruments. It's interesting, right? All right, so you're supposed to see stuff here. Uh, this is where contrast is actually quite important. So um, the light microscope uh, covers this range. So we're talking about on the order of um, millimeters on scale, uh, covering cells, uh, microns, as you move down, uh, bacteria, until you get to what we know as the uh, spatial diffraction limit, okay, which Professor Professor talked about, I know, for his, uh, 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 the last lecture that uh, he gave you guys. Uh, so that's going to be on the order of a couple of hundred nanometers, maybe 300 nanometers, uh, based on using uh, uh, visible light. If you want to see viruses and proteins and molecules and atoms, uh, currently you can't do all that using a regular light microscope. Uh, you move to using an electron microscope and there's trade-offs, right? So it's the, the wavelength associated with the electron or the Broglie wavelength is much shorter than what you have with the wavelength associated with visible light, okay? So the wavelength is what tunes how well we can see things, okay, to a, to a large extent. Uh, this is a uh, graph from the molecular biology of the cell. This is an abbreviated timeline of some important milestones in um, microscopy. Um, 
what we have here is in 1674, we have von Leeuwenhoek. Uh, he discovered the protozoa uh, using uh, a compound microscope. Uh, here in 1838, this is the birth of the uh, cell doctrine that I mentioned with Schleiden and Schwann. Ab, or oh, Abbe, um, which was discussed earlier in 1876. So Abbe was the first person who actually tried to apply the fraction theory on the resolving power of um, optics, really. Okay, so uh, it's actually a very important contribution, what we kind of take for granted today uh, that he did. Uh, Retzius uh, Kajal in 1881, their main contribution was that, or maybe a little late in 1881 actually, was that they uh, uh, introduced stains. So Professor Popescu mentioned to you all that a lot of stuff that you look at in biology is actually transparent. So you know, there's, there's resolution and there's contrast. So they're both important. And so they introduced the right types of stains that would allow them to see stuff. Okay, so Zeiss in 1886, um, later we have a mic microscope company around this guy. So he was the one who basically took Abbe's designs and applied it. Okay, someone actually applied it. And so that became, of course, extremely important. Um, 1998, if we fast forward, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, confocal microscopy, this is when the confocal microscope uh, came about. Okay, it was a postdoc at Harvard who actually uh, did this. All right, so um, I mentioned some of this stuff already. Rayleigh, Lord Rayleigh, um, yeah, the guy had an extra name. Uh, so yeah, Lord Rayleigh, a.k.a. John Strutt, he actually made remarkable contributions to optics, physics, I mean, argon. We know about argon today because of this guy. Yeah, so it's actually quite fascinating. Um, so he talked about uh, this idea of being able to resolve two objects in space, right? So the idea of a diffraction-limited um, resolution came about because he established a criterion. His is not the only criterion, but it's the criterion we tend to use. Okay. Now, I add this part here as a caveat because if any of you are in the field of microscopy, you know that every other week um, you have people coming up with new techniques to enhance spatial resolution. Okay, most of the effort is usually on spatial resolution rather than temporal resolution. And so uh, I've gone back and retooled the assumptions that Rayleigh himself had made, uh, implicit assumptions when he established a criterion. Uh, that is, the observations occur for the conventional geometry of the microscope, I mean a single objective lens. We know now that people um, have uh, devised other microscopy techniques that use more than a single lens. Okay, some of them, like for instance, four pi microscopy, pioneered by Stefan Hell, in which case you have two lenses, and you create an interference pattern in the sample to in order to boost your axial resolution. Um, we also know about something called I five. M. I think people know about that. That came about by Mats Gustafsson around the same time. So this, um, Rayleigh did not know about all that, right? So at the time, so this is sort of the implicit assumption. The excitation light is uniform throughout the sample, okay? So there is such a thing as structured illumination, which is another mechanism whereby you can have interference patterns either in the transverse direction or in the axial direction. Using a pair of lenses is one way to get the axial direction uh, interference pattern, but that has a way of boosting the corresponding resolution, spatial resolution, at the expense of unwanted side lobes, unless someone does something extra with signal processing to reduce, you know, you're talking about re uh, repeating sinusoid. Right, so you want to focus on one lobe of that sinusoid and not get these extra components. So being able to minimize those extra components because they can lead to artifacts and that autom automatically dictates the thickness of the uh, tissue that you're looking at. And that we're dealing with linear absorption processes. So we know there's such a thing as uh, uh, STED, for instance, standard emission depletion microscopy, that does not follow this. Okay, so when we're talking about the Rayleigh criterion, these are the implicit assumptions. Okay, so that just means that rules are meant to be bent once you figure out what the assumptions are. Okay, so I throw this up there um, because it's useful to think about it sometimes from a linear systems theory uh, approach. You all did Fourier optics, I think, this morning, so you probably touched on a lot of this. I don't have to say too much, hopefully. Uh, but basically, 
uh, one can think of some type of spatial harmonic function, f. Uh, you have a system that's characterized by an impulse response function, h. Uh, the system we say is linear shift invari invariant, LSI. And the response to that system is g. So the coordinates of f are um, positions in space. In general, x, y, and z, a lot of times for what we work with, for uh, um, all practical purposes, we just think in terms of x and y. Um, and one can look at now the response of the system when you give it a kick. So if you do anything with linear systems theory, you, you typically work with um, time, a one-dimensional function, and temporal frequency. So you're looking at transforms between time and temporal frequency. For image processing, we know we're working with position and spatial frequency. So that, I think, you covered earlier. So we use the language of the point spread function. So if everything were perfect, and this was a perfect imaging system, I send a point in, okay, it was our 2D delta function, and what I get out is a point. Okay, that's ideally what you would want to get if you have a perfect imaging system. You can look at it in the other domain, which is the optical transfer function domain, in which case now, instead of having this delta function because of the uncertainty relationship, you know something better in one domain, you know it less in the other domain about that property. So that means we're looking at this with respect to spatial frequencies. So the question is, um, how well does the system transfer my income in spatial frequencies that's encoded in the sample, carried by the light, out to the detector. Okay? In reality, it transfers it with a certain fidelity. Everything has a, a, some uh, spatial frequency bandwidth. Okay? And free space is related to the wavelength. You learned about that earlier probably this morning. Um, here it depends on uh, the sample, the system that you're using to interrogate the sample. So in other words, if this were a delta function, this would be a constant. Okay? So you already learned that the lens itself, because this interference effect, has an apodizing effect. Okay, if there were not an interference effect, it would be a totally different uh, story. And what, what does that mean? That means that if I have, let's say, a circular aperture, and I send in uh, a light beam through the circular aperture, and I look at what's going on in the far field, maybe using something called the Fraunhofer diffraction, then what I'll see is a Bessel function. Okay, and this Bessel function has rings around it, and this is a standard what's known as airy disk. Okay? We define the lateral resolution as the ability to resolve, and this is from the Rayleigh criterion, two points that are close to each other with, within a certain criterion. So in this case, this Rayleigh criterion, we say that the distance between these two point emitters has to be greater than or equal to uh, 0.61 times the wavelength of the light that's used to interrogate the system, this is all linear for now, uh, divided by uh, the numerical aperture. Okay, the numerical aperture we define as n, the index of refraction of the medium, times the sine of the acceptance a. Okay, so obviously what does that mean? That means if I have a point emitter like a quantum dot, and that quantum dot um, is quantum, so five nanometers in diameter, and it's the only thing on the, on the substrate, and I stick it under my microscope, the quantum dot is uh, highly luminescent, so it's gonna give off fluorescence if I come in with light that's the right energy. What do I see at the output? I see the quantum dot signal, Okay, I see the quantum dot signal, but the spatial extent of that dot looks broader than what it actually is. So I'll see maybe a 300 nanometer diameter blurred spot. Okay, there's lots of tricks that people who do nano using far field optics do with some a priori knowledge of the sample that they're working with. If things are sparsely um, separated, for instance. Now, but let's assume now I have two quantum dots and I put them now 100 nanometers apart from each other, will I be able to differentiate it? No. Okay, that's what this is telling us. Okay, so one can think of the resolution along the transverse direction. One can also think of the resolution along the axial direction. And in short, this picture here uh, connotes that it's the same idea. How, how well can I separate out two point emitters separated by a certain distance? Now the question is, well, what's that distance? 
here, these two arrows point to the distance. Here we have the paraxial focus. Paraxial focus just means that all of these uh, rays coming in, which are approximately paraxial, all focus within to the same region. They don't all fall on the same point. They're all within the same region. Okay. Now, from this uh, paraxial uh, focus spot to where you have the first minimum in this vessel uh, or this airy disk, okay, so this is what we call the first axial minimum as given by this parameter, that defines the uh, axial resolution, and that's roughly on the order of about 1.5 lambda. Okay. A lot of times when people talk about resolution, they usually don't mean actual resolution, but it's an important parameter. If you, if you want to do anything at all with 3D imaging, as resolution just isn't just the transverse 2D direction, but also the Z direction as well. That's, that's the power of the confocal technique, for instance. So, but what you see from there is that you have this um, uh, focusing problem. You have this football-shaped type uh, focal volume as a result of the differences in focusing between the transverse and the axial direction. It turns out that there's been papers talking about how there is almost an uncertainty, uncertainty relationship between the transverse and the uh, axial directions. For an aberration-free lens, and I'll talk about aberrations in a bit, these are the, uh, the equations that one uses for defining the resolution. Okay, so that means, if, so when, when people talk about diffraction limited resolution, what do they mean? That means that I'm assuming I spent a lot of money, got some really good lenses, and I put that in my microscope, right? If the lenses are crappy, because maybe I don't have the money or I don't feel like spending the money, then what happens, and trust me, these things are expensive, then, then what happens now as a result is that you're going to get resolution that's worse than this. So these are the theoretical limits, okay? And I give an example of some numbers um, using the 500 nanometer light. Um, you have oil immersion optics, maybe the 1.4 numerical aperture, and you get a lateral resolution of 220 nanometers and an actual resolution of 770. Now we can define the depth of field. Um, this is somewhat obvious probably. So um, you can think of it this way. Uh, the, the closer you are to seeing an object, for instance, maybe, for example, using electron microscopy, the less you have in terms of field of view and the less depth of focus you have, meaning you know, there's this confocal parameter by which things within a certain range seem to be in reasonable focus. You step back, you're going to get now a broader depth of field, but your ability to resolve now goes down. So there's always a trade-off between depth of field and numerical aperture and resolution, actually, right? Because this numerical aperture is proportional to the resolution as we defined it. All right, so now we can think of aberrations. Okay, so these things are uh, a bit of a pain. Uh, you see them uh, a lot, <laughs> um, sometimes because simply be, uh, we don't align things as well as we could. Other times it's because the uh, people who sell you the equipment weren't exactly uh, forthright with the information about the stuff that they sold you. Okay? Either way, you'll see a manifestation of some of these effects occasionally. So this is chromatic aberration, and we know what that is. So basically you know glass is dispersive. It's not, it doesn't have a perfect response, uh, Id identical response for each incoming wavelength. So if you have a focal length associated with a certain wavelength, lambda 1, you have a different focal length associated with another wavelength, lambda 2. Okay, so in other words, if you're using white light, each of the constituent components of the white light will focus to different spots. That's what we call chromatic aberration, okay? That's going to lead to an aberration. There's different, different spots, you're going to get uh, odd shapes, and depending on how you do the imaging, you can see this weird color effect. Now, so you can reduce this by using effectively compound lenses, right? So you use one lens of one type to try to focus the blue light to a certain area, get the other extreme, another lens of another type to focus towards the red, and you try to find a midway point, okay? So you correct for two colors. That's called a doublet. Okay. Or also is referred to as an achromat or an achromatic lens. 
Okay. If occasionally uh, people want to correct for more, so three colors, and they, they insert fluoride as another material, and we have what's called an apochromat. Okay. Now, spherical aberration is another problem, and spherical aberration comes from uh, having a spherical lens. So light that's at the extremities, those associated typically with the higher spatial frequencies on the edges, focus more tightly than the light that's coming through the center of the lens. So with the light that's going to come through the center of the lens, is going to focus to a different spot. The light of the extremities is going to focus to a different spot. So you're going to get, this is actually a very prominent problem, so you're going to get uh, distortion in your point. Ideally what you want is a nice circular symmetric spot that's defined by your diffraction limited optics, as Abby put it. So you can reduce this by using aspherics. So this all comes down to lens design. All right? So this is why you pay a lot of money, because someone is actually manufacturing these lenses to try to mitigate these issues, often more than one aberration at a time, depending on what you can live with. Okay? If you know, for instance, I'm not going to do anything with white light, and maybe I'm not using a pulse source, for instance. I reuse a pulse source in my lab, which has a 100 femtosecond pulse width. So the associated bandwidth of that source is 10 nanometers. Right, so we actually, 10 nanometers is enough to lead to chromatic aberration for us. Right, plus it's a tunable source. We like to use other wavelengths. Right, so that becomes a problem. So then there's something else called uh, coma. Uh, very exotic name, I guess. But it's supposed to represent something like a comet-like. So basically this is associated with off-axis illumination sources now. They're going to lead to different magnifications, different positions, as shown here by this uh, cartoon. And you again reduce this by using a cascade of multiple lenses of different shapes. Okay, now people have, compared to maybe uh, 100 years ago, they have very sophisticated um, ray tracing software that you pay a lot of money for that allows them to put in these different lens designs to try to minimize some of these effects. Field curvature, this comes from having a curved surface. So what happens is if you want to get the light in focus, it may look sharp at A and not sharp at B or vice versa. To try to get them sharp at the same place is hard. And so here, you again use tricks with shaping the lens. And typically when you buy an objective lens, which is what's used in the microscope, you use something called a plan or plano type of lens to correct for this effect. So for the most part, it gives you something that approximates a flat field. So for the objective lenses, I'm sure many of you have seen these. Um, different companies mark these things a little bit uh, differently, but here you see the correction for the uh, uh, flat field plan. You see the apple for the type of correction that we were talking about with the chromatic aberration. You see the magnification, the numerical aperture. Um, I'll talk about working distance. Oh, here you go. So working distance is from the distance from your last optic at the nose of this objective to the first uh, surface that's in focus, which is usually right above the cover slip on your sample here. Okay. The parfocal distance is sort of from this edge of this flange to the same surface on the cover slip. All right, so these are some typical working distances uh, associated with the different correction factors. Uh, all of this is in your notes. Uh, nothing special to say here. Uh, you can take a look at that. Um, usually, from a practical perspective, if one was starting off in a, in a lab, uh, working with a microscope, you typically would start off with what's called a scanning lens. So that's a low magnification lens, 5x, 10x. That allows you to find roughly where your sample is, uh, the thing you're trying to image, rather, where that is. And then once you find it, then you can zoom in with a higher magnification objective. Bearing in mind that once you go to higher mag, you typically are using some type of oil immersion or liquid immersion optics. Everyone's comfortable with why we use liquid immersion optics in the first place? Okay, to boost the numerical aperture. Okay, so if you're not, just let me know. Um, and the overall magnification, typically, if you're using an eyepiece, um, for instance, is going to be the objective magnification times the eyepiece magnification, <coughs> which typically is roughly about uh, 10x. So this here is to give you all an idea of the different lens types. So uh, when we want to buy something that's highly corrected, 
like a plan APO chromat that has all these different lenses, and this is proprietary. So you don't know exactly how these things are spaced. You don't know exactly what type of material goes where. That's where these different companies come in. Uh, we were talking about 10, 12K. That's for high, high magnification, high numerical aperture. So you, know, you pay the money, basically. And that's for single, that's for single lens. So you can imagine now if you have a student scratching it and putting their fingerprints and all that and cleaning it with Windex, you know, so that becomes a problem, okay? It's 10X, you know. <laughs> you know. Anyway, so uh, then you have sort of the cheaper lenses. The, these things can go down, um, I think Thor Labs, you can wind up paying um, three, four, five hundred bucks for a cheap objective lens. Okay, and you can do some really cool optics with it. A lot of optical trap and work, just some basic imaging you can get away just using something that's not highly corrected, if you know what you're doing. Uh, the basic comprime microscope, the structure is as such. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. So you have the object here, so it's your object plane, and you have your objective lens. And what you do is you relay that uh, image onto an image plane, and from there now what you have are um, additional optics in the form of an eyepiece that effectively serve the purpose of producing a virtual image. Okay, and one can think about what I mean when I say virtual image. This goes back to geometrical ray optics, whereby normally when you have a lens, we think of the lens taking the incoming rays and focusing them, but that's if it's a positive lens, or if everything's in focus, but if you defocus in a sense, or depending on where you are relative to the object, or if you have um, like this biconcave uh, lens here, then what you have is your divergent rays. And you do that because you have one last lens pair, which is the lenses in your in each eye, okay? So which is gonna refocus them back uh, so that your brain can process the image. Often we make the distinction between infinity corrected objectives and non-infinity corrected objectives. So the infinity, so the, this is the non-infinity up top, this is the infinity at the bottom. Um, so here is the one I described in the previous uh, slide. So you just have your regular objective lens, your object. Uh, you can satisfy the imaging equation, so you relay this to an imaging plane. And then um, you send this off to a detector, for instance. Or now what you have is such that your objective takes your, the light coming from the illuminated sample and it collimates it. Okay, so I go, well, what's the point of doing that? Well, microscopy has become a lot more advanced since it was first introduced a couple of hundred years ago. And often one wants to introduce other optical components, such as polarizers, certain types of filters, um, and so forth, whether you're doing phase contrast or differential interference contrast or something along those lines. And you want to do that without altering the path lengths uh, considerably, such that your image quality is still good at the output. So if you have a collimated region, you can introduce optics. And so people introduce what's called a tube lens so that they can get this thing back to an intermediate image plane and then same optics at the output end. Okay, the tube lens uh, length, uh, there's nothing necessarily scientific about that. It depends on the manufacturer. Okay, so it depends on the height of your microscopes. Uh, so typically it's 200 millimeters for Leica, Nikon. Uh, Olympus has 180 millimeters and Zeiss 165, which I thought they changed, but I'm not 100% sure about that. So in other words, if you buy an objective from Zeiss, you just can't stick it on a Leica microscope and vice versa. You could, but you have to do some other tricks to make it work for you. All right, so let's put up this picture here. Uh, you know about 4F imaging systems. So a conventional wide field uh, imaging system um, is that you have some uh, extended uh, source of light and you have, uh, we use the term uh, condenser, but you, you have a lens, and this lens is roughly 2F from that source of light, and you image that onto your sample. So now you have an illuminated volume, okay? The objective now takes that and basically images what's going on in the sample in this illuminated region onto a camera. The camera, this is wide field, so we're talking about literally using the camera, okay? 
is fast. Uh, the entire volume is illuminated, but it's uh, difficult doing any type of axial imaging. Okay, and again, what we're thinking about here in the context, uh, we'll talk about later is, uh, within fluorescence microscopy. And this is relatively inexpensive. By the way, if you want to see the inside of one of these microscopes and you see why you pay a lot of money, someone has to put all this stuff together. Okay, and even when you buy some of this, like what we do in my lab, we'll buy one of these, actually buy two, take one, put it on top of the other one, and we do some modifications to it. So it's, uh, it's, it's a work of love, um, but nonetheless, uh, it, these are fantastic machines. They work very well. And very different from what I used to use in like junior high and high school. You know, the thing with a simple mirror that flipped up, took the sunlight and brought that up. Oh, am I too old to be the only one here that remembers that? Okay. Okay. <laughs> now, confocal imaging uh, was invented. Uh, it's another imaging technique. And this was invented by someone who has nothing to do with imaging. It's a really nice story. Uh, Marvin Minsky. Uh, Marvin Minsky was someone who was working as a postdoc at Harvard University. Actually, now he's known for his work in artificial intelligence. Right. And Minsky, he wanted to do neural imaging. Uh, and he had a problem looking at the neurons because he had all this light from uh, this extended volume that was degrading his ability, his contrast, effectively. So he had a brilliant idea of why not stick a pinhole at the right places. Okay, a very simple idea. Stick pinholes at the right places. The diameter of the pinhole, that's something that's tunable, that actually scales to your resolution. But the idea is that now you have a pinhole, so now effectively you have a reduced uh, illumination volume. Okay, you relay that image that into your sample. And then now you image that onto essentially a point detector. A PMT or a CC uh, or a um, APD, uh, avalanche photo detector for instance. And so now they are at what you call common focus. So that's what confocal means. Okay? Now, from this, if this were a fluorescence-based technique, you can think about this from the perspective of writing in your sample, right? So your right source, your point, uh, has a certain size of the felt of the tip, all right? That size is going to be dictated by the pinhole properties. And what one does is they scan the beam relative to the sample, or you scan the sample relative to the beam, and you do it along x, y, maybe in a raster scan pattern, and then you can do it along z. Okay. Um, the challenge that Minsky had at the time, and Minsky was very pragmatic in a sense, right? So he, this was just something he was doing on the side to get his stuff to work. Okay. Imagine how much this has become a workhorse for uh, bioimaging today. But uh, he never published a paper on this. Yeah, rather he went out and patented it. So a very pragmatic guy. Unfortunately for him, the um, computation, uh, com personal computers, the things that we take for granted nowadays, didn't exist in the way they exist today. So to be able to take each point and form an image, uh, and this was also this was also before the invention of the laser. Okay, so to take each point and form an image required um, a lot of a lot of processing. And that's something that you couldn't do at the time. So this technology couldn't take off, and it really didn't, didn't take off until the late 80s, mid to late 80s. So the associated revolution, uh, resolution with this is given by these expressions, about 0.4 lambda over Na for the lateral resolution. And for the axial resolution, is 1.4 N over uh, Na squared times lambda. So when you assume these parameters, um, coming in with 500 nanometer light, the lateral resolution is about 140 nanometers, and the axial resolution is 540 nanometers. Much better than what you would get using just the regular conventional techniques. It gets even better if you squeeze those pinholes down. And then there's a formula that by which one thinks in terms of the airy disk for how much you want the diameter of that pinhole to be. The important thing is it depends on the biological process that you're trying to look at because the fluorescent signal itself uh, often one is starving for, for photons. And so you can squeeze this down indefinitely uh, but there's a very, very long time for you for, for which you would have to integrate to collect enough signal to be able to get an image, okay. which is always a trade-off. <laughs>
and, and if anyone's curious, from the, from the perspective of point spread function engineering, one can think of this uh, pinhole uh, idea as introducing um, uh, increased uh, wave vector diversity. Right? So the moment you move them closer and closer, reducing the spatial extent of your points, so you approach a point source, you're increasing the spread of your wave vectors. Right? So the more diversity you have in the sample, the more information this thing can carry. This is something, something like uh, what Mats Kasaf, who came up with the structural illumination idea, recognized and he figured out another way to do this without the pinhole. So typically for microscopy, we use what's called the epi configuration. And with the epi configuration, all that means is that the lens that's used to uh, focus onto the sample is the same lens that you use to uh, collect and read out the signal. So the laser light comes in. Um, and that's green, it illuminates and it's focused onto a sample. That sample gives rise to um, a uh, uh, photons that are a different color, it's stoke shifted, so it's going to be a lower energy by the process that we discussed earlier in the previous discussion. And then you have this uh, colored beam splitter that's going to allow the red to pass through and onto a detector. And one typically has, um, if this were a confocal scheme, you know, pinholes placed at the right uh, positions, like here a detector pinhole, light source pinhole, and one may use a galval pair of mirrors. This dichroic may be a, some type of gobble, galvanometer scanner so that it scans the position of the beam along the XY direction onto the sample. Sa scan the beam is much faster uh, than scanning the sample. So uh, much of this, uh, I came into as the tail end of Professor Vopescu's talk. So there's some overlap. I'll try to uh, quickly speak on that, uh, only roughly. Uh, so basically, contrast is just as important as resolution. Um, and most cells are transparent, and we give reasons as to why. So as a result, there are different contrast techniques that have been developed. Bright field is the standard, conventional, regular microscopy technique. Turn the light on, we image something. Okay, that's the bright field, right? And um, there's actually some nuances that goes on into this, whereby if the tissue is thick enough, even though it's unstained, because of multiple scattering events, depending on the wave and the light you're coming in, you can actually get some contrast, you know, for instance. Uh, but those are uh, some, some details. Uh, but so this is an example of unstained epithelial uh, cell. Uh, so you see it's mostly transparent, but you see there's a, there's a change in the index of refraction. There's a boundary, if you will, all, along the edges. So you can see there's a, these edge effects there. Dark field um, is one of the more clever things I've seen people come up with. Um, so you can ask yourself the question, uh, why can you see stars, right? Stars which are technically other galaxies, right? Because most of the sky at night is black. You know, controlling for you know, light pollution and all that in the city. But most of the sky at night is black, right? So the contrast is so high, you can boost your sensitivity to objects that are really far and small. Okay, people who do now far field nano imaging actually take advantage of the dark field technique. Right? So it's actually a high spatial frequency filter when you think about it. So what you do here, you have a light source and you have um, um, an opaque stop that's at the center of the light source. The purpose of that opaque stop is to do exactly this. So this is an image of the Born or Planck, I forget now, but it's a, it's a black spot in the center so it's going to impede or block all low spatial frequency information contained in the image. And we know that what's left, the, the low spatial frequency information corresponds to the details of an image. The high spatial frequency information corresponds to the edges. Right? So what you have left are the edges. So when you put the stop here, this opaque light stop, the, it go, the light goes through the condenser and Anything that's not uh, from the sample will just go out. It was not detected. Only, the only light that actually makes it to the sample in this system is the light that is scattered off of it. Okay. So you, once, you put a, once you put a light stop here, the light that goes through, only the scattered light now is going to reach the detector. That translates into a very, very high, remarkably high uh, contrast. Uh, 
There are tricks depending on um, how low the contrast is of the system. One can, the people have talked about just making a simple dark field microscope themselves by taking some black electrical tape, play around with the diameter and put that in the condenser. You know, you can do different tricks and it, it, it works to varying degrees depending on what you're looking at. Uh, yeast cells are an uh, example f a specimen to kind of look at as well. Um, so this is just an image of, uh, I think this is some type of protozoan. So this is the bright field image. Um, Actually, the bright field image doesn't look that bad to me here. <laughs> Think about it. So this is the bright field image, this is the dark field image, and this is actually a colored dark field. Uh, differential interference contrast. Uh, Professor Professor can expand a lot more on this because he does uh, the uh, just the regular phase contrast, but with tweaks on it. Uh, version the differential interference contrast puts polarization on top of that. So basically, uh, someone had the the insight of uh, basically um, uh, using polarization as a mechanism for interfering light within a sample. And places where you have differences in the index of refraction is going to translate into intensity differences in the detected image. Okay, all this is an interferometer. So effectively what you have here is polarized light coming in at 45 degrees. You have a polarization beam splitter. In this case, the technical details, this is a Wollaston prism, and that translates into a certain um, angle between the two emitted rays. So you want to have S and P or horizontal or vertical, whatever you want to call the polarizations. And then you have your condenser lens. Now the separation distance between these um, 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 split polarization components is approximately on the order of the resolution of your lens. Okay, 200, 300 nanometers. And then that gets focused in, the light propagates through. Uh, some parts of the light are going to see a different index of refraction through the sample compared to its adjacent neighbor. They're not going to interfere inside the sample though. Why? Because the polarization components are orthogonal. And we know that from just basic linear optics. When you take the dot product, you're going to get zero. Okay? And then what you have now, you have your collection optics and another polarizer to rotate things back into a common basis. So it's going to be orthogonal to this and then send it on to a detector. And so what you have now is that same un, um, unstained epithelial cell and you have better contrast with this artificial relief component given to the image. <coughs> okay. Okay, we have to move on. So fluorescence microscopy, is what typically gets used. I think everyone is pretty familiar with that because I, I talked about the from, from the quantum picture. Uh, but you can imagine there are different fluorophores that one can use. Uh, they have a certain absorption spectrum. They have an emission spectrum. Typically you come in with um, uh, energy that matches the excitation bandwidth of the absorption spectrum of what you're trying to excite. And the light that's coming off will be stoke shifted because it's lost energy. And so you're going to have an emission spectrum profile to that. Uh, you have various optical sources that are used uh, for regular uh, micro commercial microscopes. So they're getting really good. You can get fairly intense um, arc sources now that have a, a lot of discrete lines. If you were to stick this thing inside a spectrometer like a mercury or, or a xenon arc lamp. Uh, you have a variety of laser sources. Uh, this is a little bit dated. Uh, I'm not sure how many people are actually using Krypton and Argon now uh, for this, but it has a ver variety of lines that are available. Um, you have really good white light LED sources that uh, come, these things didn't exist when I was a graduate student, so they're getting to the point now that people can do fluorescence imaging uh, using them. And of course the titanium sapphire, which is the, the workhorse for a lot of the multi-photon microscopy techniques. Then in terms of the detector end, you can use a point detector or you can use an area detector, okay? The point detector is useful for something like on focal microscopy, you're reading one point at a time and you're doing some type of scanning, for instance. Uh, the differences in point detectors, you can have a photo multiplier tube uh, versus an avalanche photodiode. Photo multiplier tubes use uh, vacuum tubes and dynodes and APDs have um, semiconductor optics as well as um, avalanche processes that happen to boost the gain. Typically, rule of thumb, the APDs um, um, are, they give you a gain 
compared to not having it of on the order of uh, 100, maybe 1,000, whereas the PMTs would be about a million times more uh, um, responsive in gain than the APDs. So if you have low light signal, where you can barely see it at all, a PMT is usually useful for that. APD would be useful for everything else. So, <coughs> so for some people who want to do live imaging, live fluorescence imaging, where you're moving fast enough, you don't have you have a limited integration time, and they prefer using a bank of uh, PMTs rather than APDs in their microscopes. Um, area detectors it used to be such that the only detector type you would use was a CCD. Okay. Now you also have CMOS that's becoming more um, ubiquitous. As a matter of fact, I think they're trying to come out now with um, uh, microscopes that have CMOS detectors uh, with them. Essentially, uh, the difference is, so now instead of having a single detector, you have an uh, N by M array of detectors. The difference between CMOS and CCD has to do with how things are read, effectively. Do you add up charges at the end? and store them somewhere and interpret them? Or do you have some type of uh, charge readout mechanism behind each pixel? CMOS detectors tend to be much cheaper for manufacturing <coughs> and much faster. Okay, so the stuff that you use for um, webcam, for instance, these are like CMOS. Okay, so that's the basic uh, microscopy uh, talk. Unless you have a question, I'll move on. Um, we have uh, okay, a 10 second break. <laughs> All right, good, welcome back. All right, so this is the multi photon microscopy work. So now this marries the two areas. So I'll try to give you the essentials of what you need to know. And all of this, by the way, sets up a lot of what you would see in subsequent talks over the next uh, couple of weeks, okay? So, um, one probably sees, has seen a picture like this, where you have some tissue, and you're looking at the absorption lines um, as a function of uh, input wavelength, if you will. So, absorption is actually absorption slash tissue scatter, it's actually kind of combined. So here, um, you see that uh, in a lot of tissues, um, let's say below 400, you have a lot of water absorption. Above um, 700, water absorption starts to creep back in. Uh, no, so that's actually, yeah, 700, that's 600-ish maybe. So then there's this uh, pinkish, reddish, purplish, depending on your color of your eyes and all that, uh, region that we call the therapeutic window. And if you're dealing with unpigmented tissue, and within that region, the amount of uh, photons that are lost due to absorption or intense scattering is reduced tremendously. So a lot of people who do deep tissue imaging, you know, like myself included and so forth, we like to work at 800 nanometer wavelength, 900 nanometer wavelength, because actually it, the truth is this window is roughly from about 700 to about 1300 nanometers. This is when you have a reduction in the light that's lost due to photon absorption in the material. Okay, this is important because ultimately this is what dictates depth penetration into your tissue. Okay, so it's like I, I, I shine light, this red laser point onto my finger. Um, the amount of the color of this, this tissue scattering is very different for red than if I were to do it for green. You'll see this thing light up a lot less because for gr at green, more of the light's being absorbed. Okay, so ultimately that puts a hard stop on how well your light can penetrate into tissues. So for regular linear optics, uh, we're talking about a penetration depth of roughly on the order of 50 microns. Okay. Now, of course, we're talking about nonlinear microscopy. And we know it's not linear because now we have an intensity, output measured intensity, whether it's second harmonic generation or two photon fluorescence, that depends on the input intensity by this power. I to the n. So n is the number of photons that are involved 
in the particular quantum mechanical process. If it was a two photon process, the output intensity depends on the input intensity by I squared. Three photon I cubed, and four photon I fourth, and so forth, okay? Uh, so this permits optical histology. The deeper penetration depths now, we're talking about 500 microns. There's a caveat to this. Recently there was a paper published in uh, PNAS that took this down to about um, 800 microns in, in depth penetration by doing an additional trick where they're actually using something like a spatial light modulator, not unlike the digital light processor that you have in these projectors to shape the input wavefront as an extra degree of freedom. It's a very cool area of research. And once you start doing that, you can actually allow, um, increase your focusing into your tissue. All right, but there's a lot more modeling that's involved with that. So here we have our hourglass pictures, linear, non- with that technique? Mm -hmm. No, you, you can get uh, still good resolution. Um, the, the, it's, uh, it's a more complex system, uh, but the resolution is, uh, as far as I know, that's, that's not altered at all. As a matter of fact, that's one of the things we're looking into in my lab. Um, 800 microns. 800 microns. They did, uh, they went through, this was, I want to say the cranium of a mouse, actually. So it was actually quite impressive. Um, so, okay, this is a little bit tangential. <laughs> so uh, one can ultimately ask, um, where's all this multi-photon microscopy going, right? This was the uh, first two-photon laser system was invented, or not invented, well, actually, yeah, invented by uh, Webb and Zank back in the 80s, all right? Um, well, it's two areas. One is in using techniques from quantum control, where people start doing pulse shaping. They use spatial light modulators. So the cool thing about optics, so I love optics, right? It's because it's very physical. You can see it, you know, uh, and stuff, right? You can't kind of quite touch it, but, you know, it's the same idea. And the cool thing about it is that um, phase matters so much that it's ridiculous. Right? So I, I, when I teach my class on uh, signal processing, and I'm trying to describe to them audio and phase and all that, everyone's looking at me like with these blank steers. It's such an uh, ethereal concept, it's hard to grasp, right? Here, though, with light, we know if we input a linear phase, we have the effect, uh, on, let's say, a piece of material, we can mimic the effect of a prism. We know if we have a periodic phase, or index of refraction, if you will, or thickness, we can mimic the effect, uh, we can affect the phase such that we have a gradient. If it's quadratic, focusing. So why not have some electronic structure that's pixelated? The ideal situation is actually remove the pixels, right? So how monster says something without that. But that, that whereby each pixel is voltage control, and per point, per position, you can tune the phase response. Okay? So the phase, the spectral phase in particular, hasn't really been exploited in imaging yet. In the last couple of years, people are starting to do this with different techniques, CARS microscopy. They haven't done it with SHG yet, uh, but even two photon fluorescence. You can enhance the response and reduce the, uh, all the fluorescence, if you will, from species around the object you want to look at if you can manipulate the spectral phase of a structure. Right? But you have to know what you're doing, of course. Right? So with these people who do this tissue scattering work, one thing that was recognized recently is that if you shape the input wavefront, light that would normally appear to be opaque, so imagine taking a piece of glass, and we've done this experiment in my lab. It's the coolest thing. So take a piece of glass, Take some nail polish, uh, maybe a nail polish contains zinc oxide, I don't know, and then you paint that glass and you shine a laser beam on it. Okay, and from everybody's observations, we'll say, okay, there's a lot of speckle. So Professor Professor talked about speckle, it has to do with the coherence of the light and so forth. Now, uh, and that process can be described by diffusion. Okay, that's just all diffusion, but diffusion does not contain information about face. So someone recognized that. They said, hey, but what if I take that same input light now and I start to shape the input wavefront? You can do it in a blind way using optimization routines. Now, all of a sudden, that light can be focused through that scattering medium. So instead of having just a speckle, plain just randomized, randomized speckle, you have a focus intensity spot. So very recently, 
people have applied that to Imogen. Very recent, like this year. Okay, so it's the coolest thing. So that's what I'm saying. There's, there's more and more advances that are, that are happening all the time if people think about the other degrees of freedom of the light itself. Okay? All right, so from this picture, we're talking about nominally 500 microns compared to 50 microns. You have an illumination area. So you come in with blue light, higher energy photons. The fluorescence lights up the entire focal volume almost, it's hottest here, it's brightest here, and it falls off here. Whereas with the nonlinear technique, you have to get two photons in the same place at the same time. It's a rare event. You know, Maria Gopher Meyer, I don't know if I have that slide actually, you know, she said, yes, she said it, it would, if you had a really good two photon absorber, and you want to collect data to see the two photon signal, you have to wait around for about 10 million years. That's a long time to collect data. Okay, because it's a rare event and it falls off like something like uh, the distance to the fourth power. So as a result, this volume now is contained to something like a femtoliter volume. Okay, so it's very short distance. But now what this allows you to do is uh, it permits optical sectioning, right? But the more important thing here, even more important than that potentially, is that you're coming in with red light or redder light. And what did I say earlier? from the red light picture is that we have this therapeutic window. So that allows now deeper penetration depth. Even though the photons that are created are going to undergo this absorption and scattering effect that you don't want. Okay? Uh -huh. Good point. So, so, so what happens is that the pulse light itself uh, has a certain phase profile, and the question now is, if I tune that phase profile, would certain species respond more strongly than others? So, the whole area of quantum control talks about. Um, uh, affecting um, the interaction pathways. You know, in what direction does something get excited based on this effect of shape in the face. Now, uh, that's way outside of this work because there's a lot more of the things that I'm skipping over that one would have to consider. But suffice to say, uh, people have been doing that actually for at least over a decade, right? At least since I was a graduate student, they yeah. were they were doing that work. It's just that now, um, that's the recent degree of freedom that people didn't exploit. So I'll give you an example. There's a there's a researcher by the name of Ogilvy. Uh, she's at the uh, University of Michigan in the uh, uh, physics department. She does uh, multi photon interference. And she shows an image where she's imaging um, certain types of biological structures and the stuff that she wants to see is stained with fluorescence. But, and she gets the fluorescent signal. But the problem is the environment around the stuff she wants to see is all the fluorescent. When she shapes the phase using a spatial light modulator, she reduces the other fluorescence relative to the prominent target area. So her contrast actually boosts up. I, I can direct you to her, her, her work, but it's actually, uh, it's actually quite smart. No one has actually thought about exploiting that. All right, so we went over all this. Uh, I'll just mention this quickly. There's a lot of different types of uh, uh, dyes, fluorescent and what have you, and they, these are the one photon absorption peaks. The two photon absorption peaks aren't exactly where you would expect them to be because the quantum mechanical selection rules are different, um, but this table gives you an idea. Um, one can think about now going through comparing the resolutions from these different techniques. Okay, it's particularly the, the advantage or the relative trade-offs using nonlinear methods. You can think about using the intensity point spread function, and we'll we'll think of the illumination point spread function and the detection point spread function. So again, one can go by linear systems theory, do the bookkeeping, and write down how the field propagates just regular from regular diffraction or Fourier optics that you all learned earlier.
Okay? And so here, uh, this is the conventional fluorescence scheme. And here, um, the image formation is going to be dictated by the, de the detection intensity PSF. The illumination intensity PSF has some contribution, but it's minimal compared to the detection intensity PSF. So what that means is that this lens does all the work. That's for conventional um, uh, microscopy. Okay. Now, if you look at confocal microscopy, uh, this, this is almost a symmetric system. Okay. So both objectives are <coughs> important. So illumination is by point source and detection, uh, detection is by point detector. So you have illumination point spur function, detection point spur function, and you take the square, which is going to give you the intensities, because these are fields, and you multiply them by each other. Okay, so when one can take a look at the different images you get with these different techniques, I'll talk about the, in, in the end of the day, look at the big table or what the resolution is. Now when we talk about two photon fluorescence, um, here you have two independent excitation events, one coming from each photon, okay? Probability of two photon of absorption by a single fluorophore is proportional to the square of the excitation intensity. That's what I was talking about, the I square thing earlier. So now uh, we have typically what we do is we just use a bucket detector. So just a large area detector rather than the point source. Some people have done the point source thing for signal processing techniques. So the two photon um, four pi microscopy technique, one of the methodologies of doing that includes using point detectors. Okay, and that actually has a nice effect of reducing these side lobes from the interference. So what we have now, we have excitation alone, defines the resolution. So we have illumination, point spread function, but for one photon, lambda one, illumination point spread function, for, for the other photon, that's lambda two, they're the same thing, then we get this expression. Okay. And for confocal, you can do a similar analysis. Oh, this is actually two photon confocal, so it's exactly what I had on the previous slide times the detection point spread function, which is important. So at the end of the day, um, the, is there anything important here to say about this? Uh, this is just reiterating my previous slide. At the end of the day, you have these expressions that describe the spatial resolution. Uh, I put an asterisk here for the two photon fluorescence in the second harmonic generation because what this asterisk represents, <coughs> to remind ourselves, is that the lambda that's used to probe the system is lambda that corresponds to the, oh, sorry, is, is uh, the equations that are used to, to, to get this expression are obtained from noting that this is about 15% broader than the conventional, both in terms of the lateral and the axial resolution. So you're saying, what am I saying? That the second modeling generation and two photon fluorescence are worse imaging systems? To a certain extent, yes. To a certain extent, yes. And it's obvious as to why when you think about it. Because ultimately what you're still doing is you're probing with longer wavelengths. Okay? And as a general rule of thumb, remember the diffraction limits related to the wavelength. Shorter wavelength, higher spatial resolution. The power of the technique comes in a much more subtle point. That is, you get deeper. So if one wants to do deep tissue imaging, ideally non-invasive because it's less absorption, Okay? Then now the multi-photon techniques have a benefit. That's one. Two, keep in mind, these techniques you're exciting with what? Higher energy to get the fluorescence. So higher energy excitation, so typically you want to get, you have a fluorescent dye, you're coming in with let's say UV light or something closer to the UV. So what that means now, you have more increased likelihood of tissue damage. Everyone follow that? Okay, so it's a very subtle point. When you first learn about two photon fluorescence, second harmonic generation, you think, wow, this is like a magic bullet, right? I mean, I like to think so too. I work in this area, right? But in actuality, there's resolution trade-offs. It all depends on what the task you're trying to do is. And if you're interested in deep tissue imaging, then these are a, uh, a, a really good method of doing that. Um, so these are some numbers just to give you some idea. Um, of the lateral and the axial resolution. Um, if you want to compare second harmonic generation and two photon fluorescence, almost exactly the same setup, really. The only difference is the, the filters that you're going to put in. Uh, the dollar signs here represent money, 
meaning you have to have it <laughs> to do it well. Uh, so usually you're paying for either detectors, you're paying for the laser source, that's a trade-off. Hopefully with some of this cool stuff we're doing, nanotechnology and all that, uh, the laser source is becoming cheaper and that would help drive some of the costs uh, down, for instance. Um, so uh, to quickly say in two, three, four minutes, um, you can get second harmonic generation from biological specimens uh, like type 1 collagen because it's highly crystalline, okay? And now you can use them that, you can then use that to image without introducing exogenous dyes, okay? Some people introduce dyes anyway, right? If you introduce certain chiral dyes, you can enhance the SHG response. Okay, that's a possibility. It depends, again, on what your task is. But often, in this case, we image, uh, this is something we did a few years ago in my lab where we were just looking at uh, uh, the collagen fibers from the trachea of a pig and that of the uh, from air cartilage from a pig as well. Right? So everything that's lit up here, those are the collagen fibers. That's what we see. That's the non-central symmetric stuff. Everything that's dark, we don't see it. Right, because it doesn't satisfy our criterion of non-central symmetry. There could be cells there, there could be other stuff that's around this extracellular matrix, for instance. Okay? Is type 1 collagen the only uh, no, so, structure? No, myosin, muscle fibers. Um, turns out, apparently, that uh, you have these polarized um, nerve fibers that people have actually imaged um, embryonic um, uh, neural development from embryonic uh, zebrafish as, as recent as the last two years um, in vitro. You know, actually in vivo. They did this in vivo. They did this in vivo. And uh, I was quite amazed with that, with high contrast. So uh, some people actually now uh, are moving towards the so-called uh, multimodal imaging. Right, uh, so Professor Bopart is one of the people who works in this area, whereby um, if you're doing certain types of microscopy, like microscopy, like for example cars, um, you get some additional signals that come with that technique anyway. So you can get a second harmonic signal, third harmonic generation, of course, two photon fluorescence. Uh, so this was got these are images obtained from a paper back in 06, where they are looking at plant seed tissue. And A here is third harmonic generation. And again, the third harmonic is sensitive to the interfaces. Um, and same thing here in terms of the uh, B, uh, the purple colors. And green here is the SHG, and red is the multi-photon fluorescence. Right? It's, it's more of a pain, perhaps, in aligning, but it's a direction where a lot of research is going. Right? So if you can look at multiple things at the same time, which are derived from different mechanisms, the question is, well, why not do it? Well, and it comes back down to, well, just money and complexity. So the second one just taken off, from what I understand, like the over more traditional uh, two-photon fluorescence techniques for various reasons, I think. Uh, so when you name one, like uh, uh, deeper penetration depths, but also lower phototoxicity, yep. Yep, but also the trade-off is SHG is orders of magnitude weaker than fluorescence in terms of signal strength. If, 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 if you're looking at collagen fibers, ones that are highly, the most highly crystalline collagen fiber is type one, then it's cool, it works fine. But for, for endogenous, for inherent endogenous content. That's right, that's if you right. Use a, a, well, it's massages agent, then you could, you could actually... Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly, kind of exactly. And actually, that, right? the, ironically enough, SHG was observed first, before the, the two-photon fluorescence. Uh, and typically, um, the popularity in SHG has gained a little bit more momentum. Well, Campanola uh, has done a lot of work uh, earlier, especially, but uh, has gained a bit more momentum uh, because of the multimodal techniques. It's an, it's an additional color signal that you get. Uh, but a lot of the workhorse for this stuff has been carried out like in Taiwan and in Europe, uh, particularly in France. Okay. Scott Frazier, right now, because also doing Yep, thing. yep. Uh, nanoparticles give rise to these signals as well, so that's yeah. a whole other area. All right, so I'm going to have to end there. Um, Let's see, it's been, the molecular specificity uh, information and contrast. Also, you, you preserve phases.
Yes. So, so, so the work we do as sort of an epilogue to uh, what he's asking, there's an advantage. There could, there's a relative advantage, assuming one doesn't do, do time result measurements to something like second harmonic generation and third harmonic generation that comes from the fact that the process preserves phase information. So one of the things, for instance, that we do in my lab I put up the equation earlier that relates to polarization density to the second order field, right? This was the chi 2. If the medium itself is anisotropic, which is what you'll have with collagen, it's anisotropic, then P and E are no longer parallel. And they're related now through these tensor element relationships that you, you get the tensor if you're doing non-resonant excitation, you assume certain types of symmetry. So your chi 2 becomes a matrix with tensor elements. Okay, so now one can go ahead and modulate the input polarization and go back and extract those tensor element values for chi 2. And within those element values, potentially you have subdiffraction information. So some people use this to try to differentiate between very different types of tissues, collagen versus myosin. Some people have used this to try to figure out the orientation of the actual molecule itself by going backwards and looking at the hyperpolarizability, which I didn't mention, in relation to the chi 2 elements. In my case, we're actually using it to try to differentiate between breast cancer. Okay, so it's another degree of freedom that could be advantageous. I, I, like, to, I, like, to, um, I like to usually think of as a, as a take home message that I try not to think about uh, one technique being better than the other technique. One technique might be cooler than the other technique, granted. But it's not necessarily better. It all depends on the task that one is trying to do. There's no magic instrument, as far as I know. Okay? All right, thank you. Uh, hope you all enjoyed it. <laughs>